Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Lawler. I'm the Executive Director of the West Shore Chamber of Commerce. And I would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territories of a number of nations for the Esquimalt, Saanich and Sioux Electoral District. These include the uh, Esquimalt Nation, the Songhees Nation, the Chianu Nation, the South Nation and the Sartlip Nation. And I am grateful every day to be able to work uh, and live and play on these lands. So I am going to pass you uh, straight over now to Don Brown um, of the Souk Multi-Belief Initiative, who will lay out the details for this forum. Greetings. This forum is not a debate. It is an opportunity for the clients to present their views in a non-confrontational, respectful manner. The format of this forum has been used for the previous federal election and the last provincial election. We have received positive feedback from both the audiences and the candidates. It eliminates negative disruptive comments and questions and allows the audience to objectively assess the qualities of the characters of the candidates and the policies of the parties they represent. The candidates all have agreed to the following conduct and meeting formats that were sent to them last week. The candidates' presentations are to be non-confrontational. There is to be no criticism of other individuals, leaders, parties, or other parties' policies. The, the candidates are asked to state the benefits of their proposed programs to our electoral district without belittling other parties' platforms or making comparative statements of how their initiatives are better than the other person's programs. The candidates have been asked to make their presentations personal, why they believe their programs are worthwhile and to present their vision for the future of our electoral district and our nation as it relates to the priority issues being addressed. Each candidate will address for a maximum of two minutes each, why they believe they pardon me, four questions selected by the organizers based on polling results on this year's election issues regarding affordability and availability of housing, our climate crisis, both mitigation and adaptation, health issues, including COVID-19, addictions, and mental health. Cooperation with local governments to implement nationwide and local initiatives. Candidates have been asked to emphasize how the national funding promises by their parties will actually trickle down to the Esquimalt Sanic Souk riding. Following the questions, the candidates will be given a maximum of three minutes to present any concluding remarks they wish to offer. The forum will be moderated by the Souk Region Chamber President, Karen Mason. Karen will interrupt the candidates if they vary from the agreed upon conduct or if they go beyond their allotted time. She will introduce each candidate, then begin with the questions. West Shore Chamber Executive Director, Julie Lawler, will offer closing remarks. Karen, please begin the program. Thank you, everyone. First, I would like to introduce the candidates this evening. <clears throat> Rob Anderson, People's Party. Rob is a semi-retired helicopter pilot who has spent the majority of his 30 plus years flying in the mountains of British Columbia and Alberta. This experience has given him the opportunity to work with practically every resource and government sector in the provinces. He has established many friendships, including many First Nations. Because of the years spent in remote areas of the province, he has a unique insight into the universe, positives and hardships encountered. He believes that we as Canadians need to put our differences aside to work together for the common good of all Canadians. Laura Frost, Conservatives. Laura has been an environmental researcher and a land management specialist for 20 years. She has a PhD in geography from UVic on wildfire and climate and a master's of science on approaches to land restoration through indigenous knowledge. Laura is a wife and stepmom 
an avid outdoors person who loves fishing and canoeing. She loves her dogs, working in her vegetable patch in Saanich, spending time with her church community. Laura has been an active member of the Mount View Colquitt's Community Association, a volunteer at a long-term care center, and a board member for a health advisory council. Randall Garrison, NDP. Randall has been a strong voice for Esquimalt Saanich Souk for more than 10 years, working to make Canada and our local community more inclusive and equal, as well as sustainable. Randall is committed to fighting climate change with action, not just words, and understands the importance of keeping our coast healthy. He knows our local wildlife, our local economy, our future depends on it. Randall is standing with Jagmeet Singh and the NDP to make sure equality, good jobs, improved and expanded healthcare, and action on climate change are top priorities in Ottawa. Harley Gordon, Greens. Harley has worked as a chemist, an academic, an outreach worker, and a writer. He brings a diverse opinion and breadth of experience to Esquimalt Saanich Souk, as well as Colwood View Royal and Michosin. An award-winning presenter, Harley loves communicating his scientific work with community members and sharing his passion for the natural world. His deep appreciation and respect for the lands and cultures of coastal British Columbia have shaped his life and career. Harley regularly volunteers with local environmental groups involved in habitat restoration and environmental protection. Harley lives in Colwood with his wife and two dogs. Doug Kobayashi with the Liberals. Doug was raised in this community, attended John Stubbs, graduated from Belmont High School, and studied at Royal Roads in the Military College in Kingston before becoming an engineer with the Royal Canadian Air Force. After his military service, he embarked on a rewarding career in aerospace that he followed with management consulting and even a little local business that embraced his love of food. In 2018, Doug was elected to Colwood City Council, where he currently chairs the Economic Prosperity Committee. He has been married for over 42 years to Mindy, and they are very proud daughters, very proud parents of their daughter, uh, Mariko. Sorry, sorry, Doug. Uh, Tyson Strandland with the with the uh, Communist Party. Tyson is a Métis student, activist, and socialist, born and raised in Victoria. He is presently a graduate student at the University of Victoria in the History Department's Cultural, Social, and Political Thought Program although he has also studied abroad at Ukraine's Kiev Moyla Academy. Next week, he'll be defending his master's thesis on the subject of political and theoretical history of decolonization in the 20th century and the significance of the Soviet Union to the national liberation movements. Tyson has been a fierce ally in the anti-war, anti-poverty, environmental, Palestinian solidarity, indigenous race, rights movements, and more. And with this, we are going to start our questions. <clears throat> Rob Anderson of the People's Party, I'm going to start with you. And the topic and every and all of the candidates are going to be answering the same question. And this one is on affordability. Many individuals and families in our area are unable to find attainable housing due to the lack of availability and the ever-growing cost of living resulting in adequate housing or even homelessness. What programs will you initiate to alleviate this problem? Rob. Rob, you're muted. Can you unmute, please? You're still muted. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Uh, basically, our party and myself, we believe that the, the housing crisis in large part has been uh, induced due to mass immigration, irresponsible mass immigration into Canada, uh, basically swallowing up any and all available housing. Um, so the first thing is, is to, to start to limit the amount of immigration we, come, we allow to come into Canada and uh, that, that will help alleviate the, this, um, the, the housing as it is right now. I mean, well, there can only be so much building and development. I mean, it, it all takes time. But when we go and flood the market with immigration, um, you know, it's, it's to be expected that the, the housing prices are going to go up, uh, rental prices are going to go up, and there's no end in sight um, under current government. I mean, uh, but I mean, this isn't just a, a federal government issue. I mean, 
um, the CRD and municipalities have to take some responsibility in this and maybe look at eliminating some of the building bylaws uh, that are basically uh, slowing down development of, of land in areas. Uh, also need to look at um, possibly trying to, to uh, get investment to, to want to come to their area. But with the amount of uh, duplication and triplication of provincial, federal, and uh, municipal or, or local governance bylaws, it's making it so hard for anybody to even want to develop or spend their money to develop. I mean, we've, we've all got to work together to make this, uh, you know, a viable option for everybody. I mean, nobody's going to invest private dollars to, to build something if every time they turn around, uh, you know, they're running into a brick wall or another study needs to get done. I mean, simplification needs to happen across the board in order to make private investment want to come in and, and help with this. It's not just a matter of building. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Rob, very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Laura Cross with the Conservatives. Laura, would you like me to repeat the question? Sure, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Many individuals and families in our area are unable to find attainable housing due to lack of availability and the ever-growing cost of living resulting in inadequate housing or even homelessness. What programs will you initiate to alleviate this problem? Yes, I really like the way the question was phrased and for sure this is possibly the number one issue in this electoral district. So what I would like to say is that it is an issue that spans from seniors to those with disabilities, to students, to low income, to those that are having mental health issues. So they're just, and single family housing as well. So let's start with single family housing. Um, the conservative platform is to stop, uh, disallow foreign ownership and the driving up of market prices, very similar to what was adopted very successfully in New Zealand. So that's a very important position. Um, number two, um, there is help for mortgages, like we're pouring into first time owners, helping families get started with mortgages. So those are a couple of the issues with single family housing. But when we go into low income rents and affordability, like for seniors communities, um, and well, I wanna mention seniors separately because we have a few um, new platform positions on that. And one is seniors often wanna live alone or in a seniors community or with family. So there's a couple of new um, platform positions is $200 a month per household for anyone taking care of a parent over 70. So I think that's that's helpful. And also a medical expense tax credit for home care. So that's that's one issue. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And one of the most important thing basically is what we plan to do is free federal lands for housing and having it available. Like for example, we have Rocky Point in Souk, Mary Hill in Machosan, Belmont in Colwood, that's a big one, and Work Point in Esquimalt. So we're taking action. We plan to free lands and make that those more affordable housing projects as soon as possible, shovel ready. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, next, Randall Garrison with the NDP. Randall, would you like me to repeat the question? No, oh, I think we've got the question now because everybody knows there's a crisis in affordable housing uh, in Greater Victoria. <laughs> And what we need to get busy doing, first of all, is increasing the supply at the bottom end. We all know the market will create high end housing till the cows come home, but it will not create the affordable housing we need for families in our community. So one of the things we can do, and we've talked about it a lot as the NDP, is get CMHC back into cooperative housing and starting to build non-market housing that can't be monetized, that can't be part of investment, but still provides secure housing for families. We used to build co-ops in Canada with CMH support, we can do that again. So we're talking about building 250,000 units in the next five years, with the main emphasis being on non-market affordable housing. We also need to see more purpose-built rental housing, new supply, so we've suggested one of the incentives we could give uh, to developers to build purpose-built rental housing is to take the GST off new construction for those units. And that would provide a pretty healthy incentive uh, for them to get into the market. Uh, there's other things we can, we can try to do to keep 
uh, the prices from continuing to rise. And one of those is take the profit out of speculating and house flipping. And so what we've said is that the capital gains that's taxed when you sell a house that isn't your principal residence should be increased to 75% from 50%. So those are the kind of things we can do. But most important is increasing that supply of non-market social housing, the kind that's provided by co-ops and nonprofits. And we need the federal government through CMHC to get back in that business. Thanks. Thank you, Randall. Harley, uh, Harley Gordon with the Green Party. Harley, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, I'm, I'm good, Laura, thank you, or Karen, thank you. So adequate housing is a fundamental right. In, in Canada's national housing strategy, this has been recognized, yet housing is still getting more expensive. It's not getting better. Now, housing affordability is a national issue. In a lot of ways, it's an international issue. We're not the only nation facing an affordability crisis, but we have it among the worst. And, you know, and, and on any given night, there are over 35,000 Canadians who are experiencing homelessness. And solving such a fundamental issue means dealing with the problem at all levels of government, be it federal, provincial, municipal, or First Nations, working with both the hereditary and the banned governance structure. So as a Green representative, I'm committed to providing more federal support for locally-led housing initiatives. This is community-focused community and community-led change. We don't need Ottawa coming into municipalities and dictating what should be done. It should be working with local governments and supporting communities and deciding what is best. And local communities have done good work in the past. Just in Cola, there's a new development to provide more affordable housing units. It's been a great success. So the Green Party wants to invest in affordable housing through nonprofits and build more cooperatives. We want to build 300,000 more affordable non-market units within the next 10 years. We also want to do significant investment in public transit infrastructure and work with municipalities to make sure that transit hubs are effectively integrated into community plans and utilized through um, restructuring the zoning with it next to the transit hub. Now, we can build more affordable housing, more walkable cities, and more sustainable cities, and we'll get there by working with local governments, not telling them what to do. Thank you, Harley. Doug Kobayashi with the Liberals. Doug, um, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I'm, I'm also fine, um, Karen. Thank you very much. I, I agree this is one of the uh, top regional issues. Um, you know, it's obvious the beauty of our island and the temperate climate. We're get, this is the ideal place to retire. And uh, But another big factor that uh, is not well known is that the growth of our uh, tech sector right now in Victoria is attracting a lot more younger professionals. In fact, uh, Victoria is now ranked with the, as one of the top 10 tech markets in Canada right now. So uh, I'm gonna just talk basically about uh, the attainable housing right now. Okay, right now, by, by the constitution, land use is controlled by local government and many local government regulations are driving costs up. I believe the uh, federal government must take a leadership role in working with all stakeholders, including provincial and local governments, developers and other stakeholders to address the housing shortages and housing affordability. My own daughter recently just moved to Victoria three months ago. She's in a decent paying job and can't even afford, uh, find a, an affordable place to rent or buy. There's several options that I think uh, should be considered to help drive costs down. First of all, the, one of the obvious ones, of course, is increasing the, the supply. Uh, that's both rentals and new, new home construction. But we have to do this by incentivizing developers right now to increase the supply by re reducing approval timelines, by increasing densification along major transit corridors, and actually reviewing the efficacy of uh, development cost charges and community amenity contributions, which are just being passed on to potential buyers and renters. The second uh, way that we can help drive costs down is I agree, there is a lot of uh, foreign speculation buying right now. And uh, I believe that uh, we have to make, we can make the housing market a little more predictable and steady by preventing foreign uh, speculation buying. And uh, third, of, third uh, to, to help uh, with this zoning reform, because yeah, every we're, we're timed out on this one, Doug. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Tyson uh, Strandland from the Communist Party. Um, Tyson. Let me begin by saying flatly, the Communist Party believes that housing is a human right. 
that capitalist society treats it as a profitable commodity is to me unacceptable. Our goal is to end homelessness altogether. We're proposing a federal policy that will make housing a public utility by establishing federal, provincial, municipal land banks to assemble land for affordable social housing, schools, hospitals, parks, and public works. We can prevent developers and builders from snatching up valuable public land to inflate housing prices and rents for profit. Our plan is to build 1 million units of affordable social housing under public and democratic control over the next 10 years, which would be rented for no more than 20% of a person's monthly income. By flooding the market with housing available at this rate, we would also see an immediate and significant drop in the rent and sale prices of the private housing market, which would be forced to compete. In the meantime, we would immediately act to build emergency shelters and transition housing. Additionally, we would impose not only rent controls, but rent rollbacks to reduce the out of control private housing costs. We would moreover ban evictions, mortgage foreclosures and utility cutoffs due to unemployment, strike or lockout. Tenants meanwhile need to have their right to organize tenants unions supported and guaranteed. Some people may say, but Tyson, then landlords will just get out of the business altogether. Well, to that I'd respond, fantastic. I suppose they'll have to get real jobs like the rest of us. We're also fighting to increase wages, pensions, and the shamefully low disability rates to help alleviate poverty so people can afford to live. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is on climate crisis, and I'm gonna take this over to Laura Frost with the Conservatives. Laura. What proposals do you have to address the impacts of the climate crisis in our riding, including reducing greenhouse gases and adapting for climate, for climate change? I'd like to focus on two, of, I think the most important issues in um, Esquimalt Sanapsuk. And the first is the water reservoir. We know there's a limitation there and we know ahead things are gonna be unpredictable. So one of the things we're proposing and that like I'm proposing actually, but I'm backed up by Aaron O'Toole's infrastructure, large infrastructure fund is that we expand that reservoir so that we have that kind of stability for our growing population. We'll have to get the right engineering in place and do it properly, but that is just something we need to look at as soon as possible. Another area that I wanna talk about is well, the devastating effect of the heat, of the heat um, in the summer, 570 people passed away. I mean, they were in mobile accommodation. They didn't have proper cooling. That's just, that's not okay. That's not acceptable in any way, shape or form. So what one of the things our family did, and it, it didn't have to do with specifically thinking about climate change, but we brought in a heat pump. And um, I wasn't even thinking of using it for air conditioning at all. It hacked our hydro bills. So that was excellent in itself. And then um, it, when, when we hit the heat wave, my mother and father-in-law were over there and they were sheltering. So what I'm thinking is rebates. I mean, I haven't, I haven't taken this up, but I like to see additional rebates for homeowners or maybe community centers, this type of thing for heat pumps so that we have more and there's more areas for sheltering and we can address this issue as soon as possible. So I think that that is, um, I think that's mostly what I'd like to focus on. Thank, Thank you. you, Laura. Uh, if, if any of you would like me to repeat the question when I introduce you to, to answer the question, please just let me know that you'd like me to, to repeat the question for you. With that, I'm going to go over to Randall Garrison with the NDP. Okay, hey, thanks, Karen. Well, we need to start acting like we're in a climate crisis and we need to have measures to bring down our emissions by 50% uh, by 2030, not just targets. And I, I'm one of those who's tired of talking about targets. Uh, and I have to confess, I'm also a little tired about talking about individual actions. Yes, I'm one of the privileged who can have a heat pump, who can drive an electric car, but we need societal actions to bring about the scale of change we need. And so that's why I brought forward a motion in the last parliament called Motion M50, which would, was calling for an immediate end to all fossil fuel subsidies and the transfer of those funds over to a new crown corporation called Renewable Canada, 
which could start to build renewable energy projects right now in every community across the country. Now, I also said that I thought we should give a priority to Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Northern BC and Newfoundland, where there'll be some big job losses in the necessary transition, because we can't leave workers out and we can't work, expect workers to pay for the transition. But uh, if we weren't in an election, we could be uh, working on my motion right now. Uh, second piece I want to talk about is uh, responding to climate mitigation. Uh, we face a real threat here of two extinctions that I think we must take measures to avoid at all costs. That's the extinction of southern resident killer whales and the extinction of wild salmon in our waters. If we do not act quickly, we will lose both of these. And so that means much, much bigger programs on salmon habitat restoration. And what we see in our community is that volunteers are out there doing this work and they need to have the federal government get behind them uh, in order to back them up and provide the funding they need so we can restore the wild salmon runs. And on those uh, rivers where it's extinct, uh, then we can, we can look at the projects like um, the Vancouver Island Anglers and the South Nation, where they've been putting Chinook into the water in very, very large numbers with no federal government support. Uh, I've also thank called- you, Thank you, Randall. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Harley Gordon, Green Party. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. I, I want to have an explain, like a little bit of an explainer first. When we talk about greenhouse gases, we're mostly referring to carbon dioxide and methane in our atmosphere. And I want to reiterate that, that emissions anywhere are emissions everywhere. So we need to focus on a lot of large scale solutions federally. And there are so many reasonable options available to deal with the climate crisis that we're in. First and foremost, we can end fossil fuel subsidies in Canada. We can ban fracking. Now, fracking occurs in northeastern BC. I've been there to the oil fields in Port St. John. It releases methane, a lot of methane, which is 30 times worse as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. We can also cancel the Trans Mountain Pipeline. This is really important to our riding because if that pipeline gets built, there are 400 more ships every year along our coast, the coast of our entire riding. That's more whale strikes for the southern resident killer whales. And that's an increased chance of an oil spill along Esquimalt, along View Royal, along Royal Bay. You know, this is something that we can't have occurring and it is something that we can do immediately with the Green Representative. We can also protect our natural spaces. There's 30 we can protect 30% of natural spaces in Canada by 2030. And Canada holds one third of terrestrial stored carbon in our forests. This is why we need to protect our natural spaces to make, spaces to make sure that that carbon doesn't end up in the atmosphere. Now, we also need to adapt to the crisis that is already here. We've had a summer of extreme floods, droughts, heat domes. We need to ensure our forests are properly managed. We need to ensure our watersheds and rivers are protected. And we need to make sure our old growth forests and these biodiverse ecosystems remain protected and, and act as carbon sinks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Doug Kobayashi, Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Karen. This is the primary reason I ran. I actually uh, read the, uh, the climate change plan by the Liberal Party, a healthy environment and a healthy economy. And it basically works on uh, five pillars and that's to improve energy efficiency, expand renewable energy and affordable transportation, continuing to put a price on pollution. Polluters must pay. Uh, building and investing in made in Canada, low carbon products, services and technologies and uh, expanding our natural carbon fighters by stopping forest and clean ocean loss. In fact, uh, under, under over the last uh, five years, uh, there's been a 1300% increase in the protection of our oceans uh, and 30% more increase in protection of our lands. Under this, uh, under this plan, uh, Canada will continue to protect 25% of its land and ocean by 2025 and 30% by 2030. And what's a, another unique part of this plan is that the plan actually commits to develop Canada's first ever uh, national adaptation strategy uh, uh, as, as Harley was to, uh, alluding to earlier. And it should be noted that this plan has been endorsed by Dr. Uh, Andrew Weaver, former leader of the Green Party of BC as the only credible plan put forward by any party at the federal level. And it uh, has also been endorsed by the uh, former NDP leader, Tom uh, Mulcair. 
it should be noted that we are the first nation to have indigenous people have an annex on our climate plan. The two ch major challenges I see now are how we eliminate the enormous silos in government. Climate change is just not the Department of Environment's problem. It's everyone, every government agency's problem. And the second is how we change the mindsets of people. There's a lot of hard, very hard choices that'll have to be made very soon by all of us. There's no so, uh, magic silver bullet to make this all go away without every one of us being involved. We need to uh, develop employment opportunities, create clean, you, low carbon industries. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Tyson Strandland, uh, Communist Party. The Communist Party is committed to comprehensive emergency measures to ensure we achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Profit-driven corporations are responsible for over 70% of emissions, which is why we need a people's energy plan based on public ownership and democratic control of all energy and natural resources, including extraction, production, and distribution to provide for working people's needs. We would replace cap and trade and carbon tax schemes that shift increased fuel costs onto working people with strict legal limits for pollution and hard caps on emissions. Additionally, we would immediately cancel all pipeline projects and halt all fracking and shale gas operations. Corporate executives responsible for reckless environmental destruction should be faced with fines and jail terms. The military is in fact the largest single source of emissions in this country, so a realistic plan must include a 75% cut in military spending. This is a huge opportunity to put a just green transition at the center of our economic recovery. And for this reason, we propose to invest heavily to create jobs through renewable energy and conservation programs while phasing out coal. Our party would act rapidly to close the Alberta tar sands while guaranteeing jobs and wages for laid off workers in renewable alternatives in addition to freezing all energy exports and exports of water from the Great Lakes. We would build and fund high-speed rail as a superior alternative to highways and airlines, substantially expanding urban mass transit while eliminating bus and transit fares entirely. Air Canada, Bombardier, and CN Rail should be nationalized in order to help develop a publicly owned transportation system with the goal of delivering affordable, sustainable transport. Bombardier could easily be retooled for the production of trains and public transit vehicles operating on renewable energy. This is just a taste of a socialist climate plan, not just a coat of green paint over capitalism. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. Rob Anderson, People's Party. Rob, we need you to unmute, please. Good. There we go. Sorry about that. So. Uh, the, the whole climate change thing, I mean, Canada's got all kinds of, of natural gas and LNG should be one of the first things that we're pushing to the world to help get rid of the, the use of coal. Um, you know, one of the other things, Randall actually brought it up, uh, the salmon enhancement and protecting of our waterways. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why in this day and age that we haven't got all those salmon farming pens out of the ocean and onto, onto dry land. Uh, the reality is, is many of those pens are on migratory salmon routes, which does not help in our, our feeding of the whales, as well as the, the saving of the species. Um, having done many salmon enhancement projects, flying helicopters, um, I tell you, there needs to be a lot more money put into it from the federal government. And I, I believe that we should be helping with all of those enhancement projects and rehabilitation projects of those creeks and waterways. Um, I, I also think that we need to have a serious look at oil isn't going to go away and we need a national energy corridor and the unfortunate reality is is that right now most of eastern Canada a large portion of their oil is coming from ships from the Middle East that are burning bunker fuel with all kinds of carbon going into the atmosphere as well as other stuff and uh, you know, the 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 uh, climate footprint from that is just astronomical. Um, so there's there's lots of stuff that can be done, but once again, we don't want to cut off our own noses to despite our face here. I mean, we we've, we've got an economy that we have to take care of, and the reality is is that oil and gas uh, is an integral part. But 
you know, if we're going to do anything, we need to clean up our own yard first. You know, things like the, the sewage going into the, the ocean from Victoria and Quebec and things Thank like you. that. Thank you. Our next question is going to be on health issues. I'm going to take this order, Randall Garrison with the NDP. Uh, Randall, what will you do to alleviate the issues caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as improve access to treatment for addiction and mental health issues? Well, I just want to start by reminding everybody that we're not out of the pandemic yet, and we've got a long ways to go. And I really want to see an end to the demonstrations like those that occurred in Vancouver, which blocked access to healthcare facilities, blocked cancer patients from getting to their treatments, and harassed healthcare workers. And yesterday, the NDP called for making this uh, a criminal act if it continues. Uh, we support vaccine passports and we support mask mandates. These are very little, very small asks uh, for the price of keeping the most vulnerable in our society safe. Going forward, we need a much more resilient healthcare system. And that includes something I've been calling for since the beginning of this pande pandemic, and that's the ability to produce vaccines in Canada both for possible needs for boosters in this pandemic, for the next pandemic, and also so that we can contribute to filling that gap around the world where there are no vaccines available to most people in this world. Uh, we also need to complete our healthcare system uh, by making sure that prescription drugs are covered, that dental care is covered, and that mental health supports are brought into the national healthcare system. Uh, and that's the main way we can increase access uh, to mental health treatment. We need to phase out profits in long-term care. And I think that's really essential that we get started on that soon. Uh, the only way to respond to the other epidemic we've got going on, the opioid crisis, is to decriminalize all drugs and make sure that there's public safe supply of drugs. And then we can get on with addiction treatment. We can't police our way out of the opioid crisis and we will never solve it unless we treat it as the healthcare crisis that it is. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Harley Gordon with the Green Party. Thanks, Karen. Long-term care, that, you know, this is one of the major issues that happened with the COVID-19 pandemic. 69% of deaths from COVID-19 in Canada were long-term care related. So the Green Party is calling for national standards of treatment and care within long-term care facilities. This is something that we, we failed to as a, a society, we failed our seniors and our most vulnerable in COVID-19. We saw it firsthand and it needs to be rectified. We also owe it to our healthcare workers to go get vaccinated. My brother and his partner are a nurse. They are burnt out. They are overworked. They are overstressed. They have been the, on the front lines of the pandemic for a year and a half working in the, in the ER in Vancouver. You know, they, they need a break and they need everyone to get vaccinated so they can deal with the backlog of surgeries and procedures that so many British Columbians and Canadians face. We need to increase federal funding for provincial health transfers and add more funds for healthcare worker training. When it comes to the toxic drug supply and the opioid ep epidemic, the leading cause of death for people from 20 to 40 is now opioid in British Columbia. We need to immediately decriminalize opioid use and provide a safe supply and deal with this toxic drug supply by treating it as a health issue, like Randall has said. When it comes to mental health, depression and anxiety are on the rise, especially in youth. Mental health needs to be part of our health care system. We need to fix our health care system in a number of ways. Mental health is certainly one of them. People need access to therapy, to treatment, to someone to talk to, to deal with these issues that have risen and have just been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also need to increase research and innovation funding in Canada for the health sciences. Canada only spends 1.7% of its GDP in research and development, and it should be 2.5% in line with international goals. Thanks. Thank you, Harley. Uh, Doug Kobayashi, Liberal Could you Party. repeat the question, Karen? Because uh, obviously I didn't understand. <laughs> Yeah, happy to. What will you do to alleviate the issues caused by COVID-19 pandemic, as well as improve access to treatment for addiction and mental health issues? Okay. Uh, so well, obviously the pandemic uh, put to the forefront uh, the need to address mental illness and isolation caused by COVID-19. It's uh, put a tremendous amount of pressure on families. 
And I believe the government did listen and acknowledge this pain by, uh, by the budget 2021, which provided almost $1 billion for mental health care. I, it also invested to establish national standards for mental health services and continue to provide Canadians with, the, with free access to the uh, live support treatment and credible information through the, the Wellness Together Canada portal. Uh, this portal is, uh, has provided confidential uh, support to Canadians. To date, more than 1 million Canadians have had access to this portal. I believe we also need to find ways to identify and treat trauma before it turns into full-blown addiction. I think the portal is a first good step. It's a sad reality that we need to do more to support those already suffering with addiction. And this includes funding more treatment beds, particularly in the areas of our country where the opioid epidemic has taken far too many lives. Uh, there was no playbook for what we've had to endure over the past year and a half, but I believe the government uh, in conjunction with the provinces have really stepped up to, to the plate to uh, ensure we remain safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Tyson Strandland, Communist Party. Firstly, I want to emphasize that while the pandemic may have been a catalyst, it's not the cause of the current economic crisis. And that under capitalism, I, I hate to tell you, but things are not going to get better, but likely much worse. Many Canadians are unaware that Canada's public health care system is under attack, and not just in this election. It's been under attack for a long time, increasingly undermined by privatization and contracting out of health care and Medicare. Yeah. The COVID pandemic has exposed the cracks in our weakened public health care system and led to the deaths of many health care workers and seniors living in private for-profit and deregulated long-term care homes. Acute shortages of essential PPE, ventilators and vaccines have cost many lives. Now Big Pharma hopes to make a killing on patented COVID vaccines, while Canada and other wealthy countries are hoarding vaccine supplies at the expense of the rest of the world. We wanna end Canada's vaccine hoarding and make the COVID vaccine universally available through the United Nations COVAX program as well as to override patent rights so countries can buy or produce the vaccines in their, in their own labs at cost. By nationalizing the pharmaceutical industry, we could manufacture vaccines, PPE, and medical equipment here in Canada for people's needs, not for corporate profit. Furthermore, we want to end private for-profit long-term care and expand Medicare to include long-term care, pharma care, vision, dental, and mental health care. We can't risk sick workers on the job, which is why we're also fighting for 14 employer paid sick days annually for all workers. In regards to the overdose crisis, we are demanding harm reduction, decriminalization, and safe supply policies to stop the supply of toxic drugs in this country. Addiction is a disease and it is a symptom of alienation in a sick society. And we need to help people who are suffering before more people die needlessly. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. Rob Anderson, People's Party. Well, basically, I, I started saying months ago that I'd like to see a minimum 500 bed mental health facility built in every province and territory in this country. I also like to see a minimum 500 beds worth of drug and alcohol treatment facilities built in every province and territory across this country. The reality is, is the social costs on all of our, our communities from mental health as well as addictions is, is far outweighing the cost of what it would be to help our fellow Canadians out of their predicaments and to help them on a, onto a road to recovery. Um, basically, I, I hear all of the establishment parties right now spouting the same thing about this uh, pushing of, of unapproved vaccines onto society, pushing vaccine mandates and passports, uh, you know, all, all basically coming from a UN agenda. Now, this is, this is absolutely uncalled for and un-Canadian and Everybody's been trampling across our, our charter of rights and freedoms, and it's got to stop. Uh, Canada has to stand up for Canada and Canadians first, and uh, this isn't doing it. That's about all I have to say on that. Thank you, Rob. Laura Frost, the Conservatives. Hi. Um, this is a big topic, and it's such an important topic to us. Why not Sanish Souk? Um, I, I don't know if anyone's talked about doctors, but the doctor shortage is crippling. People aren't getting the care they expect. 
want or need. Um, and it's on two levels. It's on family doctors and it's on specialists. They just, I know personally hand, on personal hand, I have an autoimmune problem. And I know that in a neighboring province where I was working, um, I got in in a month to an, a neurologist. Here, wasn't put on any specialist list because it would be at least two years. So that's just me. There's a lot of people waiting for major surgeries. This is a big deal. And when I looked up the, the statistics the other day for the number of uh, major operations going on in British Columbia per capita, it was one fifth of some of the other provinces. Now I'm not saying, you know, there are doctor shortages in other parts of Canada, but it's an important regional issue here. So what the conservatives are recommend, it's, that's also a provincial issue and we're well aware of it, how, how doctors are handled, but uh, the hiring of doctors. And we of course support the province in what they're doing, but we do have transfer payments, sizable transfer payments. So the conservative government is recommending 6% above what we've got now in transfer payments. And that there might be some suggestion that it could go into different specific needs for different regions, like for us doctors or supporting that. But, you know, we're not pressuring the province. We're just saying we'd like to see this. And I personally, um, I'd like to see a bit of a report card across the across Canada on how things are lining up. So that's just one thing that I was another really important area, of course, is mental health. So one thank, thank you, Laura. Okay. <laughs> Our last question is on cooperation with local governments. With that, I'm going to take it over to Harley Gordon from the Green Party. Thanks, Harley, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been a volunteer my whole life. It, it's I haven't asked the question yet. Oh, well, I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask the question. Okay, how will you contribute towards the financial sustainability of local governments and partner with them and the provinces to address attainable housing, climate and health issues, as well as other essential local initiatives, such as infrastructure, development, seniors and youth programs and Indigenous relations? It's a big question. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, thanks for, for reading it out. So I, I, I've been a lifelong volunteer, and, and I really want to emphasize that, that I'm focused on these grassroots community-led change. This is something that, that we need to focus on from the federal level, is letting communities take the lead. You know, responsibilities have been downloaded on municipalities for years, but support and funding haven't increased. Municipalities and local governments need more federal funding for infrastructure for housing and for addressing the climate crisis. One of the, one of the programs that the Green Party is offering is increased support for municipalities to establish green space and support to bi biodiversity, even within urban boundaries. We also want to support land use decisions by municipalities and infrastructure funding through reliable long-term funding that is not always competitive grant applications. Municipalities in our riding are always competing against each other, against for federal dollars. We need to offer a, a reliable long-term funding source. We want to empower local governments with the resources that they need. You know, and there, there's been some successes, right? In Machosen, so there's a, there's a conservation agreement with the Beecher Bay First Nation for some land use decisions and federal funding can help support that. There's a lot of opportunities to work and collaborate together. We're like working within the CRD plan to reduce the emphasis on highway expansion with infrastructure development and focus on alternative transportation efforts like public transit, like bike lanes, like more sustainable transportation options. We can work with provincial, federal, municipal, and First Nations governments to really drive home that it's this community-focused change and community-led change. That's what I'll bring to Ottawa. Thanks. Thanks, Harley. Doug Kobayashi, Liberal okay, Party. Thank you. Um, I believe in the highest cooperation, uh, working with provincial and local governments and the First Nations. Um, local governments are the closest to the people and they have to face the issues head on. And as aptly said, stated by uh, Harley, a lot of the uh, issues are being downloaded to uh, local governments without the, the funding. I believe that a new sustainable funding model needs to be developed to get as many federal dollars 
directly back to local governments so they can implement and address attainable housing and climate issues, as well as the other essential local, local initiatives. I believe uh, we do not need to establish other bureaucracies or silos to administer the funds. We need to uh, maximize the money reaching the people who paid for it in the first place. I believe the federal government doesn't have all the answers, but getting all stakeholders, including the First Nations to the table to focus on these issues is extremely important. Well, uh, respecting provincial and local government jurisdiction, I believe it is the federal government's job to show leadership on these issues by tying federal funds to these initiatives. For example, increased funding for increased density. I believe uh, I have the skills and experience working with both provincial and local government leaders and the First Nations to do this. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Tyson Strandland, Communist Party. We're fighting <clears throat> for a new financial deal for cities in this election and to rebuild the crumbling municipal and public uh, provincial infrastructure. We wanna restore local democracy and autonomy, adequately fund municipal governments and services, and to give constitutional status and wealth taxing powers to municipalities. The regressive HST, GST, and provincial sales taxes, meanwhile, should be scrapped. 100% of education, healthcare, housing, transit, and social assistance costs should be taken on by senior levels of government, which would also allow us to reduce property taxes by 80%. Free public transit should be paid for by federal and provincial governments, including capital and operating costs. We could additionally reestablish low interest loans to cities and towns and facilitate municipal land banking for local projects. But I wanna talk more about indigenous issues here, which is not just a local issue. It is long overdue that we recognize the rights of indigenous peoples to national self-determination up to and including the right to secession. This is in accordance with the foundational principles of international relations accepted by the United Nations, without which there can be no real equality. Like any marriage or partnership, if it is forced and one partner can't leave, well, it cannot be equal. We're therefore proposing the adoption of a new democratic constitution based on an equal and voluntary partnership of the indigenous peoples, including First Nations, the Métis and Inuit, as well as Quebec, the Acadian people and English speaking Canada. The unelected and anti-democratic Senate must be abolished and replaced with a house of nationalities, which would be comprised of an equal number of elected representatives from the many nations which are trapped unequally within the Canadian state. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. Rob Anderson, People's Party. Thank you. So yeah, basically we just want to continue the, the, the working relationship that we've already got with the different municipalities and, and agencies across the board. Um, you know, once again, there's there's been many overlaps of responsibility, and I think we just need to sit down and figure out where these overlaps are, eliminate them, and help streamline uh, streamline everything so that you know municipalities, for example, can get projects done quickly and easily without any interference from us. Um, so uh, one of the other big ones is with our platform is, is actual removal of the Indian Act. Um, and basically a lot of us view that the Indian Act has been uh, basically Canadian apartheid. And it's, it's a matter of starting to talk to people and treat people as equal and, you know, recognize the fact that we're all Canadian and as Canadians, we all need to work together. So all these levels of government have got to start coming together and working with one principle of, of Canada and Canadians first, you know, and, and working for the, the common good and the common goal. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Laura Frost, the Conservatives. Hi. Um, this is a topic, uh, cooperating with local governments and local peoples and Indigenous peoples that I spent my whole entire career on. Um, I've worked overseas quite a bit, and what I learned in doing, like, dealing with issues of how would you approach restoration of a degraded landscape is you have to work with the people on the landscape. And if you actually want to explore 
how to restore a tropical forest, you have to work with the indigenous people who know where each seed, each specific thing is fruiting. So I, you know, I am a real respecter of um, ethnological knowledge and using that in complementary with science and that type of approach. So that's just one example. But more recently, in the last 10 years, I, I was working in uh, northern Alberta on and off and around a large basin, which is Slave Lake, uh, Lesser Slave Lake. And there's seven First Nations, two municipalities and two towns. And the thing is, everybody would like tourism and to use the land, the crown land a little differently. And so the, the way forward, the way forward right now, no one's really talking and it's difficult to get the sharing in place, but the way forward is a common vision. And that's what like, I like to bring in that. I like to work on that. I like to find the best facilitators. We have to trust each other. That's the way forward, that type of unity. So, um, I just, um, I think that's mostly what I'd like to say. That's in me, it's at my core to work with municipal governments, to work with provincial governments. I'm always looking, my thesis was called the ground, the common ground, restoring degraded lands because those are where the answers are. And I'm interested in lo solving large environmental problems, but we also have large social problems. And again, we're looking at the common ground, we're bringing in the right technology, we're bringing in the right science, we're listening to the right voices, and First Nations in particular, they've said very clearly, let's start by listening to us. Thank so you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Randall Garrison, NDP. Uh, thanks, Karen. Uh, of course, I agree that we need to get stable revenue sources for local government. As a former councillor myself, I know how big the tasks are and how small the revenues are. But until then, part of the job of the MP is to serve as an advocate and a liaison for local governments and First Nations in trying to access those federal programs. And I've worked very closely with the six mayors and four First Nations in this riding over the last 10 years. According to David Aiken, a journalist who keeps track of these things, I've been one of the most successful opposition members in getting federal funding for projects in my riding. And we could list some of the things we've gotten funding for, but what's most distressing lately is that when I write or call to advocate for those local projects, we're told that the programs are, quote, oversubscribed. And what that means is they're underfunded. And so important things like a seniors drop-in center in soup didn't get funded. The expansion of Ayers Manor hasn't gotten funded. Uh, there's a lot more work we can do because these initiatives are coming from the grassroots level who know what's needed. But uh, until, until we actually get those financial problems solved, the MP is going to have to work hard uh, as an advocate, as I said. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, one of the things that I tried to do was make sure that we put more of the just summer student jobs out on the West Shore. And uh, I was able to get more funding for jobs for nonprofits, including for the Chambers of Commerce. Uh, and I, I, I think this fits well with the priority of both Souk and Colwood to try and relocate jobs from the core of the Greater Victoria out to where people live to take some of the pressure off our carbon footprint and also take some of the pressure off the traffic. And so uh, what I'm pledged to do is continue working with the mayors and the First Nations on these kinds of projects that will actually make a real difference in people's lives on a daily basis. Thank you, Randall. That, uh, that ends our question period. Uh, we are now going to go into our closing remarks and each of you will get three minutes to, to do that. And we're gonna start that with Doug, with the, with the Liberal Party. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, West Shore Chamber of Commerce, the Souk Region uh, Chamber of Commerce. Hope I get this right, the Souk Multi-Belief Relief Initiative for hosting this forum this evening. You know, stretching uh, from a, a scramble to Souk, our riding is a conglomerate of several very diverse uh, communities. However, uh, many of our major issues are actually common. I believe I have an inclusive style of leadership and I understand the issues facing the, our riding. I've had the honor of running uh, large corporations before and uh, the privileged experience of owning three small businesses. Um, I am a local person and have volunteered my services from North Saanich to downtown Victoria to the West Shore communities. And most recently, you'll be happy to hear, Karen, I've decided to add my name to the list of volunteers at the uh, community salmon hatchery in Souk. 500,000 fish a year, wow. Um, 
I, uh, I do understand the importance of all stakeholders being at the table to solve problems. And I understand how things work in our community, in our community and who to approach in every municipality. We need to take actions on many issues and I'm a person of action. Uh, my biggest asset is I do take the time to listen. More importantly, I live by the credo. Uh, people expect you to, to listen, but what they want is results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Tyson Strandland, Communist Party. I can sit and I can talk about our policies all evening. But the fact is that many Canadians who love what my party is offering have serious hangups about the word communist. This is quite understandable not because of the histories of socialist countries and communist parties, the first to grant maternity leave and the right to an abortion, the first to decriminalize homosexuality, the first to introduce socialized health care, the countries which fought and defeated Nazi fascism and supported decolonization and national liberation movements throughout the 20th century. No, rather it's because of a long history of anti-communist propaganda that the ruling class and the corporate media have inundated this country with for over 100 years. Canada was built on genocide and white supremacy. And they have tried to hide and bury the history of socialism just like they buried the bodies of indigenous children in the residential schools to hide our own terrible legacy here. Because socialism is the only real threat to corporate power. The rich hate communism not for a lack of political democracy, but because communists want to expand democracy to the economy, to make democracy real. This isn't just political rhetoric. I say this as a historian. Capitalism has brought us a global health crisis, the threat of a new Cold War, rising racism and growing fascist and white supremacist movements, skyrocketing inequality and mass impoverishment, and today even threatens the ability of this planet to sustain life. In this country, our healthcare system, the democratic rights we fought for, the standards of living that were once consistently on the rise, these concessions were all uh, won during the Cold War, when socialist ideas and the Communist Party were strong when we led the on to Ottawa trek, and when communists were leaders in building the labor and anti-war movements. The fact is that even the NDP was at its best when it had a strong communist movement to compete with. The way to shift our political system to the left isn't by doubling down support for an increasingly right-wing social democratic movement or looking to parties that offer a third way to make capitalism work better. It is working exactly as it's meant. Not for us, of course, not for working people, but for the rich who are richer than ever, well, for us, living standards have actually fallen despite a 40% increase in labor productivity over the last 30 years. Just a single communist in parliament would send a shockwave through the ruling classes and we could work with progressive members of other parties to fight for working people, for policies like free universal post-secondary, a $23 minimum wage, democratic reform, progressive taxes that make the rich pay and a universal guaranteed livable income. But even a substantial increase to the communist vote in this election would have a far greater effect than throwing away your vote in so-called strategic voting. So please vote for Canada's party of socialism and let's get some principled fighters for working people in parliament. Let's make a Esquimalt Saanich Souk the red riding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tyson. Rob Anderson, People's Party. I'd just like to thank uh, thank you for having me on here tonight. I'd also like to thank all of the uh, fellow candidates for for speaking. It's uh, it's good to hear everybody out there and, and speaking. Um, yeah, basically we're just you know at the People's Party we're just asking for accountable government. Uh, we're we're asking for uh, a stop to the the mandates and the pushing of experimental vaccines on society until until we get the science proven. Uh, the reality is is none of the vaccines that are out there right now are approved they're all under interim approval and you know let's just start acting responsibly and taking responsibility for for our actions a little bit um but once again just want to thank everybody you guys have a great night and uh, we'll see you out there thank you rob laura frost the conservative party i i really want to leave everyone with the hope that I feel in my heart, which is why I'm part of the Conservative Party of Canada. I, I reviewed the platform very carefully. I, I'm a PhD scientist. I didn't take it lightly. I found 
no jargon, and also all their policies. And I felt very comforted with it. I mean, our logo is Secure Canada's Future, and that's what I felt. So I feel very positive. And I just want to reiterate some of the topics for Esquimalt Sanich Souk that I'm here to, to move forward. So affordable housing. Yeah, we have a plan. Cut off foreign ownership. And number two, um, number two, open up federal lands. We have two straight ways forward. Boom. Um, health issues. Focus on doctors. We need more doctors. It's a provincial issue. Right. But through transfer payments, encouragement, support, we might be able to support work through that important area and mental health as well. I, I didn't have a chance to say, but dealing with mental health and opioid, opioid issues is extremely important. And we have a platform for that. So in terms of the climate change um, and, re, and adaptation and resiliency, getting the re reservoir um, uh, increased in capacity for our area and also, um, encouraging rebate programs for things like heat pumps, yeah. And finally, yeah, I'm a big supporter of working together. That's what I've done all my career. And um, and so I that will be my complete approach if I'm elected. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed this opportunity and thank you, Karen, for hosting. Thank you, Laura. Randall Garrison, NDP. Uh, thanks, Karen. You know, we've come through a lot together since the last election. The pandemic hit us hard with loss of loved ones, health challenges, financial hardships, and often ugly racism. The discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves at residential schools has made it impossible to look away from the urgent need for action on reconciliation. And this summer of extreme heat and wildfires has presented us with incontrovertible evidence that we must treat the climate crisis as the real emergency that it is or will have to live on a planet on fire. All of these have hit us hard, but undeniably some of us much harder than others. Do Democrats fought for you in this minority parliament. We fought for a universal CERB to replace lost income, a 75% wage subsidy, 10 days paid sick leave, so that people could stay at home when they were sick instead of risking spreading COVID. We worked effectively across party lines to respond quickly to the pandemic. And right now we could be back in parliament working on things that are important to ordinary working families in this country instead of being in this early election. In this campaign, Jagmeet has put forward clear measures to make Canada more fair and more resilient, like bringing dental care, prescription drugs and mental health programs into our public health system and a federal income support program to lift all seniors and all people with disabilities out of poverty. And we'll pay for that with a wealth tax to cover these costs. When this parliament ended early, I was left close to the finish line, not just on my renewable energy motion, but on several other personal projects. I've been working to make sure that the Canadian forces respond better to mental health challenges and to recognize that while not all injuries are visible, they are injuries just the same. That report died in draft form in committee. When the pandemic brought a spike in domestic violence, I wrote a bill to give us a new tool to respond earlier by making coercive and controlling violence and intimate partner relationships a criminal offense. I got as far as the unanimous Justice Committee report just before we were adjourned. And of course, I was heartbroken to see the bill to ban conversion therapy die in the Senate when the election was called. This delays putting an end to the harmful practice based on the idea that gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and non-binary Canadians like myself are broken and need to be fixed. Let me close by saying thanks to the organizers, my fellow candidates, and to those of you who stuck with us online. I believe the pandemic has taught us that when we pull together, we have what it takes to meet the tough challenges ahead. Tonight, I'm asking for your support to go back to Parliament to continue fighting for you. What I offer you is my record, my experience in getting things done, and my commitment to continuing working hard for the people of Esquimalt, Saanich Soup, and for Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. And Harley Gordon. Thanks, Karen. The first question I got when I decided to run for MP for Esquimalt Spanish Soup is why? Why run for office? I'm a scientist, I'm a writer, I'm a volunteer, I'm not a politician. But I'm running for a lot of serious reasons. First and foremost is I'm not being represented. 
at the federal level. I'm not being heard. My community is not being heard. Young people are not being heard in our parliament. We have issues that are growing, like affordability, like the continued growth of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. They're not being solved. This is why I'm running in the first place, to deal with these problems with a bolder vision than has been dealt with in the past. And why weren't for the Greens? I mean, the Greens have their issues. You know, we have our hiccups, our disagreements, and that's very true. But our vision remains bold. And our commitment to climate action remains true. We're still the only party committed to grassroots, open, democratic, and ground-level change. We're a party that's run from the bottom up, not the top down. It's member-driven. Members like myself, members like all the volunteers that have been helping with the campaign. No more backroom deals. No more whipped votes. It's real democracy. It's open and clear. And sometimes it's a little messy. That's what you get with the Greens, but that's okay. This is why we're the only party that can offer sincerity when it comes to community-led initiatives in federal politics. And we can achieve big changes by thinking big with a, with a long-term vision, right? I'm, I'm running because Ottawa needs more voices that are thinking about the next 50 years, not the next four or the next re-election. Tyson brought it up, net zero by 2050. You know, it's a slogan. It's the idea that we have to come to a solution with the climate crisis by 2050. That's going to be a lived experience for me. I'm going to be 58 when we achieve net zero, when we achieve success in dealing with the climate crisis. I won't even be retired yet. You know, I'm running because the future fills me with anxiety because it makes me scared. And that's not okay. I'm running because together, if we commit to bold action, if we commit to real change, we, we can build a future that, that we can look forward to. No longer fills us with fear. That's why I'm running for office. And, and I do want to thank everyone for, for joining us here tonight. It was um, it was great to hear from everyone. And I do appreciate the open de democracy and, and the non-confrontational format of this. So thank you all. Thank you, Harley. And and thank you all for, for, for joining us tonight. We are now going to go over to uh, Julie Lawler and she's going to wrap it up with the closing remarks. Thank you, Karen. Uh, just uh, therefore, on behalf of the West Shore Chamber of Commerce, the Souk Region Chamber of Commerce, and the Souk Multi Belief Initiative, um, I, I want to echo Karen's thank thanks and really thank you all for participating. Uh, Tyson, Rob, Doug, Harley, Laura, and Randall. Uh, I hope that this was a, was a good experience for you. And for those of you who are going to be watching this afterwards, this was specifically created to give you as voters a chance to hear the platforms without some of the rhetoric that sometimes accompany these kinds of events. So thank you to all the candidates for your participation in this. Um, in addition to thanking you all as candidates, I really do want to thank um, the West Shore Chamber's partners, Souk Region Chamber and the Souk Multi-Belief Initiative who have really done all of the heavy lifting on this event. So thank you. Um, it's been such a pleasure to collaborate. And uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, I guess I have uh, just uh, two things to close with. Uh, the first is please vote. I expect that if you're watching this, you're already planning on doing that. Uh, advanced polls open on September the 10th if you can't wait until September the 20th. And uh, it is a stressful time out there. Uh, people who are putting themselves forward for office are under particular pressure. Everyone's under pressure because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Please be kind. Please be kind. So thank you all. I really appreciate uh, the chance to hear about your party's platforms and what you are bringing to this discussion and democracy in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks. <laughs> good night.